Okie doke, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome back, everyone. Um, if you go ahead and look at the fall 2018 announcements, CS199, EMP, what do you want to see October 18th? You should find a link to the lovely slides for this week. So, looks like a couple of you are finding it. Cool. All right, so thank you guys again for taking the survey. Um, you can still take it, but I'll be closing it tonight. That'll probably be my bedtime routine, just brush my teeth, put on my pajamas, hop in my bed, turn off the survey, and then go to sleep. So if you want to modify any of your answers or if you haven't taken it yet, uh, please do so before then. Um, I feel like that's self-explanatory by any questions there. All right, so your weekly links for giving feedback. So again, we have an anonymous feedback form just for EMP here. This is different. Hope you, uh, hopefully you've noticed that it's different than the main lecture one that we have now. And then I also have a topic suggestion form. So we're starting to get to the point where we'll be able to start going over some cooler stuff in a couple of weeks. So. You'll find that right there. Or song suggestions. Um, I will put the disclaimer that I'm very, very unlikely to choose any country songs on there. I will fire those shots. But uh, questions there? All right. We'll just hop into it. So what did we do since last time? More weird stuff. Just kidding, all that's really awesome, but if you're anything like me when I was first learning, all of this like references and interfaces and everything else was just overwhelmingly weird. But we'll go over it, so hopefully it's more cool and less weird by the end of this. So object references. So references are the way that we indirectly access the pieces of data. So this is how we're referring to the actual object that we're creating because as you guys have probably noticed, we are doing these things on laptops. So ultimately, stuff comes down to zeros and ones, but we're creating representations such as triangles or cats or animals or whatever else. So we have to actually access that memory inside to the zeros and ones that are representing the objects and we do it through references. These are not the actual objects. They're a way of getting to them. So objects are only created when you use the new keyword that we've been using. So references, whenever we have the left-hand side, that's how we access the object. And then we, when we have new whatever on the right-hand side, that's what's actually creating the object. So with that being said, references, they can either look at an object or look at nothing. So for instance, you could have person, not a person yet is equal to null. So that would be the reference looking at nothing. And by the way, this is not a good variable name if it ends up being a new person, but you could look at null. Questions there? So maybe you've noticed, especially if you thought you were creating something new, but really it was referring to the same object. Did you have a question? Yeah. Whenever we want to check if something is null, we use equals equals. Does that mean that null is a reference? Um, I think of null as like the zero representation of an object. So, um, so I was wondering, like, in, in memory, is there like a space that was always dedicated to representing like uninitialized for an object, and that null points to that space? So null isn't actually, um, at least if I remember correctly for Java, it isn't actually referring to anything. So it's not like a dedicated space it, or like dedicated value. It's um, kind of like 
just our way of saying it's not looking at anything yet, but it could potentially later. So it's just free space. Like if you were to try to print out the value, you'd probably get some like garbage random bytes coming out of it. But as far as like if you were to look into Java memory, you wouldn't see something that outright set in like null or something. So I don't know if that helps, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I'll have that in a couple more slides, so if my initial like explanation doesn't really make sense, hopefully it will later, but um, the double equals is if they are referring to the same object, so if you created a new object and set two variables equal to that object, that would be the double equals. Um, the dot equals, you would have to have some sort of value representation that isn't related to memory. I mean, you could define it with the memory, but that would be the same thing, but it would be more along the lines of you would typically see if the values are equivalent. So it's like straight equals versus equivalent in some way or another that you would define or for instance, like string, string defines. So. Does that initially make sense a little bit? More? Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> so with object references, just like if you were trying to set two things equal to each other, you could have multiple references to the same object. So if we were to transform this bit of street between Champagne and Urbana, um, so Windsor Road actually re would be referring to the same just stretch of road as County Road 1400 North. So this is my real life example. So if you were to see if Windsor Road was equal equal to County Road 1400 North, that would be true because they're referring to the same stretch of road. So if you were giving an address and you're like, oh, you go down this road, and it's just like, oh, I'm on this road. It's like, oh, it's the same road. Or I don't know if, you, like this might have just been me, but me and my cousins, when we were younger, we would get into arguments because it would always be my aunt. So I would say aunt whatever, but it would be their mom. So they would be like, no, her name's mom. And then we're referring to the same person. So another real life object of reference versus there's only one aunt slash mom. So questions there? Cool. All right, so another example, and this isn't me taking out my bitterness or frustration sometimes, but let's say I have an apartment called Leah's Place. It's a new apartment, and it has some address, and I have some roommates who also live in the same place, so they're referring to the same apartment. So if I clean up the place, and I'm abbreviating system dial the print line to S out. So if I want to see if the place is trashed, it'll print false. But if my roommate decides to trash the place, this is affecting my apartment too, because it's referring to the same apartment. So all of a sudden, even though I just cleaned it, I'm referring to it as my apartment is going to print true because it's trashed. So just to show you what I mean real quick. So if we have some apartment code, so we can have the address, a boolean on whether or not it's trashed. And then if we clean, then trash becomes false. And then we return uh, trashed to see if it's trash. And then if we want to trash it, we set trash to true. Go ahead and test that. So the first sum in prints false, and then we print true. So this is because it's referring to the same object, even if we have two different references going to it. So we could do something like, So this would print true for the double equals because it's referring to the same part in memory that is representing an apartment.
And then this is actually a useful uh, debugging technique. So you can use the um, hash code or to string to keep track of if you're dealing with two different objects or if it's just two references. So if you print out the hash code, like we did a couple weeks ago with uh, the different arrays, um, you can see whether or not two references are referring to the same object or two different objects. Questions there? All right, so pass by reference. So most of the methods that we've been writing so far have been uh, passed by value. So the method will actually have its own copy with the same value. So you can see in this fun little animation over here that it has a copy of the cup that we want to fill. And then pass by reference means that the method will be working with the actual variable. So it actually goes to the place where the variable is declared in memory and will modify it, just as in this animation, where if we pass by reference, we're actually filling the real cup that we were wanting to fill, not a copy of it. Questions there? All right, so making copies. So shallow copies, um, it just copies the reference, so they're pointing to the same object. So again, this would be like setting uh, my, roommate's apartment's my roommate's apartment to my apartment. It's just copying the reference over, so they're referring to the same object. Deep copy, it actually makes a new object, so the word new is going to become involved here with the same fields and values of the original object. So another object is in existence, fully independent, and I personally liked this source. I just have a random link to um, what I thought was a nice reference so we can have two different per persons, and then deep copy would be two independent people. So if that helps, then awesome, if not, Questions there? All right, so comparing things. So like we went over before, we have uh, reference equality. So if two references are referring to the same object, they are equal. And then we have object equality. So if you remember that we had to use dot equals for strings, or at least try to remember that we have to do that, it's the class defined equality. So it's not always as straightforward. So depending on how complicated the objects that you're trying to create and what you consider to be equal, but generally we'll have it based on the field values. So if you're trying to see if two people are equal to one another, you might see if their first name and last name is equal. Questions there? All right, so interface. I enjoyed the little picture that I found when Googling for the images of interface. So I think that the definition is a little rough to try to read through, but hopefully it starts to kind of make sense where it's a shared boundary across which two or more uh, separate components of a computer system exchange information. So um, a simpler way that I would think of it, or at least I think it's simpler, is the way two different components can communicate with structuring that they all understand. So like if you have your smartphone and you tap a place or you make your finger go from the bottom to the top, the phone is going to understand that, that this is you scrolling and it's going to move the text upward. So. This is just how we establish kind of a mutual communication, even though you are completely on, like have your own thing going on than your phone. So these are two separate components in the system, but the phone understands what you're trying to do, at least most of the time. Sometimes my phone doesn't understand that I'm trying to hit the J button and thinks I'm hitting K or something. But you at least have the structuring that you can 
communicate to your phone what you want to do, even if you're not spewing zeros and ones at it. So good on definition of what an interface is. All right, so we'll focus, we'll be focusing a little bit more on software interfaces, specifically Java. So interfaces don't actually do anything useful by themselves. Instead, they have to be implemented by a specific class. So this is where the implements keyword comes into play. And you also have to implement all the methods that the interface declares in order to use it. So I know that at least initially when I first heard this terminology, it didn't sound that useful to me. I was kind of like, what's the point if I have to define everything myself? So I have a little example. So I really just wanted to show off my 3D Pong game that I made a couple years ago. I thought it was so cool. It's a little tidy, but so Basically, this is actually what I had at the top of my class. So public class Pong 3D extends applet implements action listener and key listener. So I extended my project and inherited everything from applet so I can make a small application. So that's what you can kind of see over here. But since it's a Pong game, it's not necessarily that interesting if the user can't interact with it. So I wanted to be able to do things and communicate with the user through buttons and key presses. Oh, for my software engineering class. But I went way harder than I needed to. But thank you. Yeah, it was fun. The 3D li the Java 3D library is a giant pain to work with, by the way. Yeah. yeah. And we'll get into like APIs and like other libraries and packages and all of that, but that's where documentation comes into play as well. Because there's one functionality in the 3D library and like I was using a constructor and it didn't actually set one of the flags. So I was like digging through the depths of Stack Overflow and they're like, oh yeah, this doesn't actually work. You have to manually do it. I'm like, okay, <laughs> useless, yes. So that's my rant, but <laughs> back to interfaces. So Action Listener and I, um, the Java doc you can find right here. So. This checks for what action was executed, like a mouse click. So if you look back over here, we have new game or test game. So I actually, the method that I actually had to implement and define what it did was called action perform. And then it takes in an action event E, which would be something like a mouse click. So I would do different things based on if the button for game mode was selected or test mode or if there was a game currently in progress, but I had to actually define what happens given the event. So this is where interfaces come in handy because I don't want to have to define how to get an action, but I knew exactly what I wanted to happen uh, once an action uh, was detected what to perform. So this is specific for my Pong game. And then I think that the key listener is a little bit more interesting and perhaps we'll give a better example. So again, I don't want to figure out how to access the keyboard, but I want to do stuff if the key is pressed. So if you're familiar with the Pong game, you can move like left and right or up and down depending on the orientation. So I had to define um, something uh, if the key was pressed, so given a key event, so if the interface read in a key, or if a key was released, or if a key was typed. So key listener, I didn't have to deal with um, actually obtaining the key events, but I got to define uh, what happens if a key was pressed or a key was released. So if the key was pressed, I could move the little uh, pong guy left and right. If the key was released, I would stop it. And then type is typically used on if you're just detecting individual characters, so if, so if a user is spelling something out. So 
Yeah, this, this is kind of where interfaces can come in handy, especially ones, other ones that people have defined. So even though I had to define my own methods, there was still use and purpose for it. So any questions there? Yeah? Yeah, so this all kind of goes along the lines of the inheritance and then abstract classes, which I'll go over in a bit later, versus interfaces. And I'll go over the pros and cons a little bit later, but interfaces is a good way, like in this case, where I can use something where um, it exists somewhere else. So uh, somebody wrote up the documentation for key listener. I just got to use it and then define my methods, but not have to worry about getting a key event. So that's where interfaces became useful for me, at least in this specific example. So any other questions? Okay, so interface versus inheritance. So there's obviously trade-offs to both of them. So um, at least for inheritance, only one inheritance per class. So the reason for this, and some languages actually allow for multiple inheritances, but that gets really complicated. Java's just like, no, I'm only going to allow one. Because two classes might define different ways of doing the same thing. and Java just can't arbitrarily pick. So if we could have a class where it was inheriting from two things, those methods are defined in the classes that they're picking. So you run into what's called a diamond problem, where you have two classes implementing different things and one class that's inheriting from both of them. And the class isn't going to know which method to pick. Meanwhile, with multiple Inter or with interfaces, multiple interfaces are allowed because interfaces are just saying what the class is doing, not how it's doing it. This is because we define what's going on. So if two different classes that we are using as an interface specify different, the same method, we're defining what that method is in our class, so it's going to satisfy both of those. So that part's cool. Yeah? Yeah, so if you were to extend it and overwrite it, in theory, you could get away with it, but that would be really, really complicated for Java to try to figure out whether or not that you're going to overwrite it. Also, because if you're trying to cast different things, it just gets too complicated for Java to try to do. But I believe that's how other classes or other languages would implement multiple inheritances. But at least Java doesn't do that. And then... So interfaces can only be implemented. So it's different than inheriting from a class. So we have what's called abstract classes I'll go over in a bit. And um, again, like these are all, like they have very, very similar features, but all very distinct from one another. So. Interfaces would be like 100% abstract. Yeah. Yeah, and honestly, I think abstract classes are like really weird because in theory, um, you can have an abstract class that has, I think I have a slide on this in a bit, but like abstract classes, you can have everything as abstract, which in that case, you may as well just I implement an interface, and then you can have something where everything's defined, and like the only thing that makes it abstract is the abstract keyword at the top of the class, so it's weird. Yeah? So it would be like, um, in my example, um, I wouldn't like want to have to deal with how to get a key event from the keyboard, but I would want to do something that would, like I wouldn't want to worry about anybody, anybody else's definition of what key press was, because 
I wanted to define it for my specific uh, application that I was making. So with the pawn game, I would want a paddle to move left and right. Chances are like 99.9999% of people who are trying to use the key listener interface would not want a Pong paddle to move left and right. So um, they would just want to be able to take in a key event and do stuff with it, but they wouldn't want to have to worry about overriding definitions or writing your own. So there's stuff that still like allows you to do different things even though you're having to define every single method. So that was a lot of words. Um, did that cause further questions or confusion? <laughs> yeah? What's the difference between implementing an interface and then, or just like calling a function that, like a method? So implementing the interface, you're actually defining the function. So you actually physically put in like the little curly braces and say what you're doing in there. But it still has the same method signature, so if other things are going on, like for instance, um, with like key listener over here, so it actually gets the key event, so that all gets taken care of, but I still have to define what's going on, which is different than just straight calling a method that might already be taken care of. Like if we were doing stuff with inheritance where we could just call the method or not even have to worry about defining our own, then um, we could actually use, let's say the parent's method, um, equivalent of the method or just use the parent's method. So this we actually have to like define stuff before we can ever use it. But whenever we have inheritance, we potentially already have stuff that we can use. We just get, in this case, we get to choose whether or not we want to override it with our own definition in the class. This one we're forced into it. We can't do anything until we define every interface method. So does that clarify things a little bit? Cool. All right, so interface casting. So again, we can cast an object to any interface that it implements, but anything we've additionally defined in the class, we can no longer use. So the trade-offs and risks that you take whenever you cast something. So just as a real quick example, so we've been dealing with a lot of stuff with pets and animals. So let's say I have a horse class. I can actually extend the pet class. So if I were to make some sort of like farm animal game or pet game, and I can have a pet horse, then I would want to inherit everything from pets since the primary, like what I would be using a horse for would be as a pet. But also maybe I would want to do something where I would have a ride animal, rideable animal interface where I can actually ride it. So what we're actually gonna see is that if we take this out, we're going to get yelled at by Java that um, it has uh, an abstract method ride and rideable animal that we need to define before we can even use this. So we're not even going to get that far. And then we can define what happens when we ride a horse. And I feel like horses go clomp, 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 clomp. So not a very exciting ride. But this way, we can add. Um, other functionality while still keeping what we would want horse to be. Yeah? In, like, we have to define it because if someone tried to call that method and it, it didn't find it inside horse, it would look in um, rideable animal and like see that it's not, that method is actually not defined in the cache. Um, I mean, I know double won't let you like. Uh, okay, it, yeah. Like, if like you didn't have like ride inside like the only other place that would be is in rideable animal and it's not defined, so. Yeah, exactly, so it has no method by it. So actually what happens when you do is it's going to yell that abstract methods can't have a body, which I think sounds funny, <laughs> but. 
So essentially in interfaces, we're just listing out everything that it needs to implement. But like you were saying before, if we were trying to actually use it, it has no method body for it to execute whatever is going on. So bad times for everyone. So questions there? Yeah? Yeah, exactly. So if it's inheriting from a parent class that implements some sort of interface, it's already taken care of in the parent class. So if the child class chooses to override some method, then that's fine. If not, because it's inheritance and not interfaces, uh, inheritance will take care of everything because interface or inheritance <coughs> says how something is defined, which we can choose to overwrite. And then interface says what needs to be defined. So very small difference in English syntax ex explanations, but does that make sense? Cool. Yeah? Um, I think interface is default to be public and abstract. So will it make some difference? Like I put a public modifier in front of the interface keyword. Um, so, like right here? Yeah. So if I remove the Um, I believe it still defaults to public. Yeah. So, um, if you left out the keyword public for, um, any of the classes or interfaces or, um, class methods in Java, I believe they all default to public. So you would only have to specify if you wanted something private, which I haven't thought about if you would ever do a private interface. I don't yeah, think that makes knowledge. sense. Yeah. Yeah, that doesn't make sense. So. Yeah, so it defaults to public. I think I think any class yeah. the Oh, that's fair. Yeah, but again, like since you can't even have private interface anyway because that doesn't make sense, at least in Java you're not allowed to, so it would it would at least default to um I think it would default to public. Cuz package protected wouldn't make sense either. Any other questions? Cool. All right. So <coughs> abstract. So abstract class, um, you can't actually create an instance of it but you can inherit from it. So it can provide methods for the class to use, so you can already have some sort of functionality, unlike interface where nothing is implemented. But it forces definitions um, of methods from the inheriting class. So that brings me to abstract method, which again, it forces inherit the inheriting class to actually implement. And then abstract art is that. So what I kind of touched on before that I think is kind of 
funny about abstract is you can technically have an abstract class that has all abstract methods, but that's an interface at this point, so often you should just make it an interface. But if any of your methods are marked abstract, you must make the class abstract. This is because if you were to try to declare an instance of it, Java wouldn't know how, how to use the abstract method because it was marked as abstract, so you haven't defined it yet. But you can still have an abstract class if you mark it as abstract, even if zero methods are actually marked abstract. Question? Yeah, so, um, I'll, yeah, I'll segue into my example on that. I guess it's the only, so that's the only reason I can think of where you would, you would have, because then interfaces only have like constants, and mm -hmm. uh, just forget like the headers, right? So then yeah. Then you want to also like have instance variables, and you can like, input also with constants, and like you didn't want to actually define stuff, but you still want to instance variables, I guess that's yeah, that makes more sense. I hadn't thought about it that way. So if you were wanting to actually have instance variables, but that was all that you cared about, then abstract class would be the way to go. So nice. So in my little example with an abstract artist, because abstract art, so we can have Member variables such as public double money, so how much money do we have? What I'm going to make abstract here is make art because any class that is going to be extending this class, it needs to say what kind of art that you're making because there are lots of different artists. But I'll go ahead and define the method sell art for whatever double amount, so money plus equals amount. And then I have a Boolean method, can't afford ramen. So if we have more than 13 cents, we can afford ramen because there's a reason why there's the term starving artist. So, oh, and something fun that I think would be nice to point out is that you can actually see if it's an interface or abstract class, or just a normal class in IntelliJ. Abstract has these two little half circles on the side, and then the normal blue column with the C there. So, so I define film director, so that extends artists. So with make art, it actually marks that it implements the method in artist. So if I were to comment this part out, we would have an issue because there's an abstract method called make art and artists that we need to implement. So we can put it back and we're good to go again. And then we get to find some other things like what's the main genre that the film director makes, how much the net worth is. So this actually comes from the money that we defined in artists. So back to what was said before, if it has the member variables in the abstract class, we can go ahead and use them. So money from artists comes in over here. And then we can say make movie if we wanted to extend make art. But make art is just going to say I, I made a movie. So if we go back to the test class, where we test everything. So. I'm going to make a new film director, Steven Spielberg. He seems like he's been doing all right. He's a film director. His net worth is $3.7 billion when I looked him up last, so pretty all right guy. So if we wanted to do something where he can make art and then sell it, so I was looking at Ready Player One and made $582.2 million so we could sell it. And let's find out if Steven Spielberg can afford ramen. So when we, whenever we say make art, it says I made a movie. And true, so Steven Spielberg with his 
3.7 billion plus whatever he just made for Ready Player One, Steven Spielberg can afford ramen. So questions there? Cool on abstract versus interface versus inheritance and everything else? All right, so quick word on Java memory management. So Java has its own garbage collection. So that means that we don't actually ever have to explicitly say the keyword delete. Unlike other languages, Java will take care of it on its own. So if it sees that there's no way to get back to an object, it deletes it. So no reference, no use, throw it away. And if there's still a reference, we can still use it, so Java will let it be and not touch it. Questions there? Very high level stuff, but it's interesting if you take compilers. So practice, again, like I said, I'm going to start putting together some practice, so I put some stuff on inheritance that you can try out if you like. If not, um, are there any questions? Stuff in general, yeah. Oh, okay. Have you guys gone over that in class? No, but we are having those in the MPs. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, for the pixels. Well, yeah, they, they, I think they make it like a ride. Was this in RG? BA pixel. Yeah. Where was this? What line? It's like, yeah, yeah, you go over it. Okay, yeah. So, basically, at least the high level of what a switch statement is, is you can kind of think of it as like uh, potentially, in my opinion, a more readable if else um, statement because what's going on here is you said that these are enums, so um, yeah. oh yeah, here we go. So this is kind of a way for if you're going to be using something a lot, you see how like we didn't actually. Um, like explicitly give these values or anything, we just threw it in enum. Java is going to actually like automatically like number these for us. So every time we say red, this is actually referring to like an internal like number on the inside. So I believe you get. Um, I believe for Java, you get to use it just like a normal int. It's like an int, yeah. At least the way that Java implements it. And if you're not giving specifics on how to use it, it'll just go to int. But so like the first one, zero, the second one's one. Um, yeah, I think it does it in numeric order here. Let me write something in my practice because I don't want to. I don't. Remember if I need stack. I think you need commas in Java, right? Yeah. Word one, two. Word three. So this is like a convenient way of declaring things as Yeah, so when we use switch statements, <coughs> I believe for Java, at least for C, you have to have like stuff that can be said is a numeric type. So like um, ints and characters, since characters have an integer representation. So with the switch statements, if you're saying stuff like the string, um, it, it doesn't know how to do that in case statements. So, um, I 
Oh yeah, what did I call this before? Test. No, it's not worth it. Oh, there's a value of it. We can just see what happens if you do word one. Oh, so this is just going to output it. And then, we do stuff like values. That's interesting. Well, that was way off track, but basically it's just a way um, for us to like keep track of um, red, green, blue, alpha, and all of that stuff without like explicitly like assigning it to values because the, it's going to have like an enum representation of it, which uh, allows us to use it in uh, switch statements. So we can see with case, so case red, because I believe this should give you an error. Well, maybe Java does allow you to use it with strings. I didn't know that. Cool. Well, regardless, it's kind of more for like readability sake. And then so with switch statements, as soon as it hits a case, it's going to do whatever's inside of the case. So in this case, it would be <laughs> in this case, it'd be uh, return um, this, and then, so you can have multiple things going on, so all of these are going to be, um, yeah, so, um, so it's, it's going to match up just like an if else statement on the first thing. So if there was a way that was defined, but I can't think of a way where you would define um, a case where it would be. But if you were to switch it where um, it would hit the green before red, um, you've already returned in here. So um, you would be done. Yeah. I know in uh, C++, if you don't specify the break, as soon as it hits a case statement, it'll start hitting every case, uh, case after that. Same in Java? OK, cool. Yeah. Thank you. OK, yeah. I, yeah, I thought that there might have been like a little time spent on that, but it's kind of one of those things where, like, you don't particularly use it that often, but it's still good stuff. Any other questions? MP class or otherwise? Today's homework? I will give the disclaimer on, let me see how much I can talk about. Um, yeah, so that should be fixed now in the deadline extended, right? Uh, okay. Uh, this one, right? No. Oh, comparable lines. Oops. I'm a TA now. I don't have to do homework. Yeah. 
Yeah, so uh, are there specific questions that you have on this? Um, I, I might leave this until he actually discusses it in class, but basically um, a high level um, explanation is there are some like safeguards that you can use in Java in order to like prevent your uh, program from completely um, like crashing or failing. And um, whenever you don't put like the safeguards in there, you can get the warnings about unchecked or unsafe. So if you don't fully understand what's going on with your code, then you set yourself for up in a potentially like unsafe, like whenever you're actually running the code something bad can go wrong, so. Um, yeah, that could be an example of it. It's because what? <coughs> Yeah, so again, trying not to give like too many like spoiler alerts, but um, you'll learn about like. Yeah, because I um, checked out the clonable English thing. Mm -hmm. so I want to use the full method. I found out the clone method throws the Yeah, so I'm pretty sure exceptions come soon. So. They're kind of like fun little safeguards to make sure that like if something goes wrong in your program, your program can still keep running. Um, and like if you don't have them there and something wrong happens, then your program just crashes. So I'll leave fun stuff. Any other questions? Nope. Cool. All right. Well, the rest of the time is yours. Um, if you have questions, just let us know. We're here to help out. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. And then life stuff in general, I know the drop deadline is like tomorrow or something like that. So if you need somebody who's been through stuff, feel free to talk to me. But yeah. So, question real quick. Well, it's, well, it's what's the answer. Okay. <laughs>